It is so good to see all of you here. Some of you I have not seen in a while. Delighted you're here. This morning, um, our scripture reading is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it starts at verse 12 through 22. And I know it's on the screen, but if you're like me, I like a book in my hands, and the Bible is the best. On the screen is King James Version. I am going to be reading from New International Version. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Oftentimes in the Bible, they um, use repetition as an exclamation to bring it home, and I know that repeated several times. So Paul is saying, this is important. We may be individuals, we are, but we are all one together in Christ. Will you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, you have blessed us greatly. We live in a wonderful part of the world where all we do is look out our windows and we see what you have given to us, the birds, the trees, grass, flowers. And we're thankful today that we have had rain. We've needed it. Father, we thank you for this Sabbath day that we are together to spend time with you, to worship you, and to learn. We also thank you, Father, for answering so many of our prayers. We think of Heidi, that she is home and mending. We ask that you will please continue to be with her and heal her completely. We have many requests, Father, on our hearts and on the prayer chain. We ask that you will please answer each of those in your way that is best. Father, we ask that you will please be with our children. Hedge them about, protect them, keep them for you. We ask that as we listen today, that our hearts and our minds will be open, that we will learn more about you, know you better. And most of all, Father, we thank you that you love us. You are actively working for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Those of you who are familiar with Randy Roberts from the Loma Linda University Church, he will be having our sermon this morning, of course, on, on video this morning. And I know that you'll be blessed. I was watching part of it, and um, he really speaks from his heart, and he, I know that he will speak to yours as well. And about 70 years ago, back in 1953, Theodore Weedel, an Episcopal priest, put pen to paper and produced the parable. So it's possible that you've encountered it somewhere along the way. I know I certainly have, but what I wasn't aware of was some of the backstory to the parable itself. Weedel was canon chancellor of the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., the National Cathedral has been called an architectural marvel. If you've ever been there or have seen it even in pictures, you know how true that description is. It was a cathedral whose founders believed it should have a role to play that was quite significant. In fact, on their website, they say that the founders said, in a nation without a national church, we have grand purposes for the National Cathedral. And some would argue that such purposes have been accomplished. I'd like to show you three pictures of the National Cathedral, just in case you haven't seen it. It's quite a marvel, isn't it? To think of worshiping there on a regular basis in its, in its large spaces, its hot acoustics, the hallways and stairways just speak of elegance and institution. In fact, speaking of that word, it has become an institution. Consider, after all, that a president was there when the first stone was laid. President Theodore Roosevelt, September 29, 1907. A president was there when the last stone was put in place. George H.W. Bush, exactly 83 years later to the day, September 29, 1990. Not only that. But presidents have had their lives celebrated therein. Seven have had memorial services there. Three have had their actual funeral services there. Dwight D. Eisenhower, Ronald Reagan, and Gerald Ford. In fact, the National Cathedral was the location for the last Sunday sermon of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And I read that they have a space window containing a moon rock that the Apollo 11 crew gave to the National Cathedral. All of that brought together, you would have to say that if any church is an institutional church, the National Cathedral must qualify. And then there's Theodore Weedle, canon chancellor of the church, who put pen to paper and wrote the parable. I wonder if you've heard it, I'm going to read it to you, and I want you to think as you listen to the words of the National Cathedral. Once upon a time on a dangerous sea coast where shipwrecks often occur, there was a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut, and there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea. With no thought for themselves, they went out day and night tirelessly searching for the lost. Some of those who were saved and various others in the surrounding area wanted to become associated with the station and give of their time, money, and effort for the support of its work. New boats were bought and new crews trained. Their little life-saving station grew. Some members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge of those saved from the sea. So they replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in the enlarged building. Now the life-saving station became a popular gathering place for its members, and they decorated it beautifully and furnished it exquisitely because they used it as sort of a club. Fewer members were now interested in going out to the sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the club's decorations, you understand, and they even kept a liturgical lifeboat in the room where club negotiations 
were held. About this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast, and the hired crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet, and half-drowned people. They were dirty and sick and from all kinds of backgrounds. The beautiful new club was in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower house built outside the club where the victims of shipwreck could be cleaned up before coming inside. At the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. Most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities altogether. They were unpleasant and were really a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insisted upon life-saving as their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station. But they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the lives of all the various kinds of people who were shipwrecked in those waters, they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. So they did. As the years went by, the new station experienced the same changes that had occurred in the old. It evolved into a club, and yet another life-saving station was founded. History continued to repeat itself. And if you visit that seacoast today, you will find a number of exclusive clubs dotting the shoreline. Shipwrecks are frequent in those waters, but most of the people drown. I wish Weedle were alive because I'd like to ask him some questions. I'd like to ask him, for example, did you, did you write that parable before the National Cathedral or after? Maybe you wrote it during your time at the National Cathedral. Did you write it as an observation of what occurred or as a warning of what could occur? Did you have other churches in mind as you wrote it? And then maybe the most important question of all, I would say, Reverend Weedle. When you wrote that parable, were you thinking of Loma Linda University Church? Honestly. Because the parable makes me uncomfortable. It unsettles me. I'm only further unsettled when I read what different sociologists of religion say. People like Max Weber and Ernst Trelch. Richard Niebuhr, because they say that religious movements have a certain life cycle. They start with a lot of passion, a lot of energy, a lot of commitment, a lot of excitement. We have a vision. We have a purpose. This is what we're about. They speak to that with all the power of Amos and his other Hebrew colleagues as prophets. They stand in the gap. They call people to task. They say, we're going to do great things for God in the world. People are energized. They're drawn in. They're excited. The entry point into the movement is to be born again, the Spirit of God abiding in your life. They, they aren't concerned much at this point about structure and policies and protocols and procedures and all the other realities that will later come into play. Right now, it's about the mission. But a problem occurs. Such a compelling mission, such on-fire disciples are magnetic. And so people come. They're drawn in. They're captivated by the mission. Pretty soon there's enough people that the leaders say, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. this is chaos. We've got to do something about this. We can't live and function in this fashion. And so they begin to set up structures and procedures and policies, and time passes. As time passes, people are not so much born again and join the movement, they are born into the movement. They weren't part of that original fire and passion. Now they're part of what has become more structured and more settled, and time passes. There comes a point at which the concern actually becomes as much and ultimately more 
about supporting the structure that has been built than it is about the mission that had been felt. And then people begin to get uncomfortable. Members begin to say, wait a minute, this is not what we're about. We had a mission. We're not here to support the structure. The structure is here to support the mission. And so they begin to fragment off and to form their own mission-driven groups and, say the sociologists of religion, the cycle begins again. And that bothers me. That concerns me. That's enough to keep preachers up at night. The question being, is there no way to change that, to interrupt that, to live in an ongoing fashion, sold out to the mission as a vibrant community of Christ followers? Is there, in other words, a way to be unprofessional disciples rather than professional consumers? So that's the name of this series, five-part series. We begin today. It's entitled simply Unprofessional. Unprofessional. Now, I'm keenly aware that there are different ways we use that term. In fact, if you type in to your Google search bar, dictionary.com, and then when you get there, you type in unprofessional, you'll discover that there are at least six different meanings to that term, unprofessional. Probably the most common of which the way we use it the most often is to denigrate or demean or make statements about somebody else's behavior, morals, or ethics. We will say, for example, I can't believe how he conducted himself in that meeting. The way he acted, the way he spewed all his anger over everybody, it was so, what, unprofessional. That's the way we tend to use the term, and that is an absolutely appropriate use. But that's not our interest in this series. That's not the way we'll use the term here. Rather, we are using unprofessional to refer to the person who may do his or her job exceedingly well, may be committed to it in, for example, the church setting, and yet has not been academically trained for that position or professionally hired for it. They are unprofessional in that sense of the word. Historically, the Christian church has spoken of such individuals as lay people, the laity. But don't go off of that term because we're going to talk more about that in coming days. Unprofessional. In fact, the subtitle captures what we're hoping to talk about, God's design for ministry. Is there a way that we can capture God's design for us as a church that will keep alive in a sustained way our commitment to that to which Christ calls us? That's our question. We seek an answer by going to Paul's first letter to the ancient church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to helicopter in and land right there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, so let me give you a bit of the lay of the land, a bit of context to what's happening there. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, an eminently gifted congregation, tempted to depend upon its giftedness, upon its eloquence, on other blessings that they have been given. And Paul is calling them to task over a number of things. Right here in this section that we're going to read, he is telling them, as the body of Christ, you are called to certain ways to live out his will in the world. In fact, we're going to read a, a section of it. And then we're going to back up and linger over three thoughts that grow out of this passage. Because the truth is, the passage we'll read, we could spend weeks on. It is deep and it is rich. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning with verse 12. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles. Some are slaves and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. 
And if the ear says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And these parts we regard as less honorable, and the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require the special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Rich passage. Many different truths contained within it. I want to focus in on just three of those. I, I hope we can draw it together to us as the Loma Linda University Church and with the backdrop behind it of the life-saving station and the country club. How do we remain mission-focused? How does this church accomplish that? Three simple truths. Number one, you are vital to this church. You are vital to this church. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 again. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Many parts. This body has many members, but all those members together make up this local expression of the body of Christ, and you are vital to this church. I know it's tempting to feel that that's just a trite statement, tempting to think, I don't, ma come on, if I wasn't here today, nobody would miss me. I would make no difference in the life of this church. Be careful. Part of Paul's point in this passage is that even the weakest and the, and the most hidden members are vital to the body. For example, have you ever heard the term turf toe? I wasn't terribly familiar with that, and if you want an explanation of that, I will be glad to point you to some physicians and physical therapists who can explain it to you. Because I can't, other than to say, when I first heard the term turf toe, in my mind, I kind of diminished it. It's a toe. I mean, a toe, come on. Not the whole body. Oh, you broke an arm or something. It's a toe. Well, I was to rethink that. I was to rethink that because at that time, there was a football player who had turf toe. In fact, arguably the best NFL cornerback of all time named Deion Sanders. He, he played for a variety of different teams, the Falcons, the Cowboys, 49ers, the Redskins, the Ravens. I mean, he, he made his way around the NFL, and he's still there. He's a sports commentator today. His last year and a half or so in Dallas, though, he didn't play up to expectations, didn't play up to par. He was being paid an obscene amount of money at that time, and so the Dallas fan base was getting restless. restless. Come on, Dion, come on, man up, step up, do what you're paid to do. It's a toe. But he couldn't. A few years ago, he was on a talk show, sports talk show, and they got to talking about the turf toe, and he took his shoe off, and they showed a shot of it. It was like, whoa, that's not what I expected. And then he shared some pictures that were pretty grim and gruesome. And right at that moment, I realized, yeah, turf toe is a deal. It's a big deal. It's just a toe. You know, I think that's what many are tempted to say in the body of Christ. I don't really matter. I'm one of many. 
don't make much of a difference. Not even sure I'd be missed if I wasn't present. And then we come and we read Paul saying, every part of the body matters. Understand, to say, I don't make a difference and I don't really matter is not making a commentary on you as much as it is making a commentary on Christ, who has, through his divine spirit, inspired Paul to say, every member matters. And if any member sells out to me and to my spirit, if I'm able to guide that person in his or her life, you have no idea what I will accomplish. You are vital to this church. You are vital to the body of Christ because every member matters. That's the first one. The second truth is not just that you are vital to this church, but secondly, you have a role to play in this church. You have a role to play. Now, let me preface this by saying this. In a large congregation like this one, it is not uncommon for people to come here because they're wanting to get lost for a while. Over the years, we have had people come who are coming for example, out of ministry situations in which they have poured their whole life and soul into ministry. And by the time they came to the end of that tenure, they are exhausted, depleted. In Spanish, they say, le sacaron el jugo. They squeeze the juice out of the person. And by the time they get here, they don't want to do anything. I don't have anything to give right now. I just want to sit and be ministered to. If that describes you, welcome. Sit back and enjoy some ministry, some soul healing, because all of our lives have seasons. My only point would be to say, make it a journey, not a destination. Others have come who have been beaten up by life. Life has gone sideways and then upside down. Family problems, professional problems, church problems. And now they just want to hide. I don't even want to be seen. I just want to slip into the back pew. If that's you, welcome. We're delighted you're here. We pray that we can minister to you effectively in the name of Jesus. But again, just bear in mind Keep that a journey, not a destination. Because Jesus is not done with you either. Because the truth is simple. You have a role in this church. You have a role in the body of Christ. Back to 1 Corinthians 12, this time verses 14 to 16. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? And yet, friends, that's what we do. And I understand it. We sit back in our pews and we watch what happens up on stage and we see the, the sanctuary brass play what they play, the orchestra play, the music sung, the piano played, and we say, forget that. I could never do that. That's professional quality. I can't do that. So I'm not really a legitimate part of the body. Friends, that's heresy. You are a part of the body. When we come, we bring our best to Christ, absolutely. Absolutely. But the church is filled with many different places where we can exercise the gifts that God has placed within us. You have a role in the body of Christ. Always. Now, honestly, it is true. Some roles are internal. Some roles are external. Some minister to the body and some reach out to the world. I don't know which yours will be. Sometimes they're internal. 
Sometime take your, your phone, your Bible, your digital phone, and type in the search bar the two words, one another, from the New Testament. And just notice how often those words appear. Love one another, support one another, encourage one another, forgive one another, comfort one another, over and over and over, one another, one another, one another. That's the body ministering to the body. Maybe that's what Jesus has gifted you with, with ears to hear and a heart to feel. You come alongside and you minister. Our staff has been studying through the book of Acts every Tuesday morning. And one of the things that has stood out for us has been the role of Barnabas in the book of Acts. Barnabas is always drawing someone in, come in, drawing some, and he changes the trajectory of Christian history because he draws in somebody named Saul who will become named Paul. And There's that ministry. Maybe that's that to which God has called you. I don't know. I, I <clears throat> am deeply moved at remembering the story, story that came out of Willow Creek Community Church in South Barrington, Illinois. There was a man who had sat in, I don't know if it was a Bible study or a worship service, but had heard this very theme discussed, that each of us has a gift with which we can minister in the body of Christ. And so he went to the volunteer center. I'm here to volunteer. What can you do? I don't know. Now, it just so happened that this man's name was Mike Singletary, NFL Hall of Fame middle linebacker for the Chicago Bears. Hadn't been entered in the Hall of Fame yet. Still part of his career. I don't know. I just heard everybody has a gift, and, and, and we need to put it to work. I want to. And an elderly lady there who was screening the volunteers said to him, well, we need, we need someone down in the, in the nursery to hold the crying babies. And Singletary said, I can do that. And so the person observing said, there, I watch him walk down the hallway, an elderly lady leading an NFL middle linebacker down to the nursery to hold crying babies. You have a role in this church, in the body of Christ. Whether it's on a piano, an instrument, whether it is with the outreach program, whether it is encouraging others, or whether it's holding crying babies. You have a role. Sometimes it's within the body. Sometimes it's outside the body on behalf of the body that we come here together and we huddle together as we worship and as we pray and as we strengthen each other, as we draw encouragement, as we understand God more, and then we go out to be the church in the world. Maybe that's where your ministry is. That's the gift he's given you. Whether it's in a doctor's office, a boardroom, whether it's as a construction worker, a truck driver, whatever the case might be, you leave this place to go and to live out Christ's love in that context. In fact, listen to these words, words taken apparently from the pen of the great Presbyterian New Testament scholar J. Gresham Machen. There is some debate as to whether he actually authored the words. Whether he did or not, the words are absolutely on target. So listen to what was written. For Christians... <clears throat> pardon me, to influence the world with the truth of God's word requires the recovery of the great Reformation doctrine of vocation. Christians are called to God's service not only in church professions, but also in every secular calling. The task of restoring truth to the culture depends largely upon our lay people. He wrote several decades ago. We're calling that in this series unprofessional. To bring back truth on a practical level, the church must encourage Christians to be not merely consumers of culture, but makers of culture. The church needs to cultivate Christian artists, musicians, novelists, filmmakers, journalists, attorneys, teachers, scientists, business executives, and the like, teaching its lay people the sense in which every secular vocation, including above all the callings of husband, wife, and parent, is a sphere of Christian ministry, a way of serving God and neighbor that is grounded in God's truth. 
Christian lay people must be encouraged to be leaders in their fields rather than eager to please followers, working from the assumptions of their biblical worldview, not the vapid cliches of pop culture. To that I say, amen. Every single member of the body of Christ has a role. I don't know if your role is out there or in here, but what I do know is that if you belong to Christ, you have a role in this church. A third truth. First, you're vital to this church. Second, you have a role in this church. And third, without you, this church is diminished. Without you, this church is diminished. So back to 1 Corinthians 12, reread one verse, verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? Do you know what Paul is asking there? You know what he's saying there? If I could enlarge and use my words to describe what I believe is his thought, I would say this. There is the temptation to say, well, the whole church is that. It's its worship and music department. It's its outreach department. It's its children's department. Whatever the case might be, that's the whole church. I'm not that, so I'll just check out or I'll just warm a pew and I'll not get involved. Paul's point is to say, when we take that approach, the whole body is diminished. The whole body. Because we never know what would have happened had you taken seriously the fact that you belong to Christ, you have a gift, and he has called you to minister with that. If we never receive it, we never know what we missed. But we can work backwards and ask some questions about some who came from small beginnings. I love the story of the tours going through Europe who came to a certain village, very picturesque, just had the feel of history. And the tourist grabbed somebody and said, were there any great people, any great men, any great women born in this village? And the resident looked rather surprised and said, no, there weren't. Here, only babies have been born. <laughs> How true. We never know what might be done, what might have been done. If we just say, no one will miss me. I don't have that much to contribute. Do you know what happens? The church is diminished because of what you could have done in the power of Jesus. I want to read to you some words. They come from a, a, an internet site. I, had, I had, have a file in my computer where I store illustrations and then on certain weeks go there just praying, dear Jesus, please help there to be something there. <laughs> well, this week there was from 10 years ago. I looked it up, internet site still available. It's written in bullet points. It's not written in normal, the way a normal piece would be written. But how true these bullet points are yet today. It's entitled, Why the Church Needs New Structure. Here's what it says. If most churches lost their pastor in their building, they would die immediately. Christians have been trained to be and are spectators. Most Christian activity now is listening to sermons. People are lectured to rather than trained by doing. Yet experts say we forget about 90% of what we hear, but almost none of what we do. People are trained by what we do, even more than by what we say. More than anything, Christians now are being trained to attend meetings and listen to sermons. We learn by doing. Jesus said, follow me, not listen to me. What the church is doing now is not scriptural. This is the most important reason we need a new structure. Strong words, words written as though it were in response to Weedle's parable, saying, if, if 
we take seriously Paul's words about the body of Christ, about the fact that each one is vital, that each has a role to play, and without any, we are diminished. If we do that and respond, the life-saving station will live on and not become just a club. This is made evident in so many different ways, in so many different places. I've shared with you before my own father. My own father, coming, coming out, of, out of a background where he didn't know anybody, nobody knew him, just a baby was born in a troubled family. Ran from church and God for a long time. Until finally somehow the grace and the spirit of Jesus gripped him, turned his life around, transformed him. And he accepted, began to follow, began to study, dedicated his life to ministry. I just have etched into my mind different things dad said along the way. Maybe none more so than one I shared some years ago, but I'll repeat here. Driving west out of Fort Worth, Texas, I was sitting in the passenger seat. Dad was driving Mom and Anita were in the back seat on my way to visit her, my sister. And Dad telling about being in college, union, was tough, hard work, much harder than he had thought it would be. He was selling religious books, trying to make a living, trying to pay the school bill, rather. My mom was working to make a living. And yet, his background and his pool days of gambling on pool were present. He said, I knew I could go downtown Lincoln and pay off my school bill in two or three nights, but somehow that didn't seem to quite line up with pastoral ministry. So he said, I didn't. But I sat in class that day and wrote a letter, wrote to one of my pool hall buddies and said, this is too much, it's too hard. I got to make some money. Meet me in Las Cruces and we'll head out west. Driving out of Fort Worth, Texas, I was watching dad's face and I could see the tears glistening in his eyes. He said, when that class ended, I folded up that letter and stuck it in my pocket. He said, for some reason, for some reason, I just never did mail that letter. He said, I have thought over the years how different my life would have been had I mailed that letter. And I remember thinking, your life? What about my life? The lives of my siblings, the lives of your grandchildren, and the lives of tens of thousands of people who heard the message of the love of Jesus over a 50-plus year ministry. What about them? It would have been so easy to say, I don't have anything to offer. There's a different way that's much easier. They won't miss me anyway. So what would I say to you? I would say to you, without you, this church is diminished. The body of Christ is diminished. The kingdom of God is diminished because he called you to this place with a special purpose in mind. He wants to use you in ways that not only build the body, but that build the very kingdom of God. You say, but I'm not a trained professional. Good. Make it easier. <laughs> I haven't been hired for ministry. Good. Then it will be heartfelt. That's what we're going to talk about, friends. The fact that we can give in and accept just being professional consumers or we can delve into the body of Christ with all that we are and become unprofessional disciples. Because the truths are simple. You're vital to this church. You have a role to play in this church. And without you, this church is diminished. So I think of the parable, the life-saving station, the club. 
And I think if somehow we can allow the Spirit to get a hold of us with the truth that we are members in the body of Christ, we can save this church and many others. We can save many lives out there. And at the end of the day, some of the lives that we save will be our own. Gracious God, it's really stunning to think, really stunning to think that you value us that much, that we are the body of Christ and that if we don't act, then Christ is perceived as being absent from the world. So Lord, let us, by your Spirit, incarnate his love. Grip us, change us, empower us. That is our prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen.